Well, it's, it's uh, can you hear me okay in the back? Is that working? Yes? Better? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm uh, <clears throat> an organometallic chemist that's going to give you a report on a, um, on a fairly detailed organometallic project. <clears throat> um, I was explaining to somebody earlier, we're, we're, our project's supported by NIH, and we're essentially, at least by my, my uh, study section, precluded from doing technology, and I'm focused totally on detailed mechanistic studies. <clears throat> so uh, if you're looking for the interface with solar, uh, that's what the ANSWER uh, project is um, going to help us do, and the presentation this morning is by me is going to focus on what we know from synthetic models about how hydrogenases work. The, um, and we, we're now at the stage, virtually actually this year, where we know the synthetic modelers know enough that we can contribute to the biology. It's been a long time uh, coming, but we can now uh, do that, I think, um, fairly convincingly now. Okay. Um, there are three hydrogenases officially in nature, <coughs> and they're part of what we call the bioorganometallic proteome, um, <coughs> or inventory. And uh, the, here they are. They're um, in red. The iron-iron hydrogenase, it's the newest member of the series in an evolutionary sense. It's the really lively, it's the really if highly active one. <clears throat> There's the nickel iron hydrogenase. It's the one that is, um, fuels helicobacter in um, ulcers and is a, which in turn is a significant um, biomedical issue. And so there, the interest in hydrogenases is to some extent motivated by medical considerations. And then there's the newest member just coming out in the past uh, year, slowly in dribs and drabs, and that is HMD, which is a real weirdo. <coughs> and, um, <coughs> and I'm going to talk about each one of them. In general, I think the theme is that there is this area of organometallic chemistry that um, nature figured out about uh, a few billion years before Jeffrey Wilkinson and Gordon Stone and a whole lot of other people, and that is they've been doing a lot of chemistry with CO, hydrogen, methyls, acyls, and there's an opportunity here to learn a lot of basic uh, new chemistry. <clears throat> so I'm going to, I'm going to again. The the proviso is that I'm going to focus uh, not on the solar interface, but on uh, fairly detailed me mechanistic uh, themes. Um, here's some motivations, and uh, in a general sense, and that is that uh, the um, probably the hydrogenase is at least the nickel iron one has been around for a long time and is uh, highly optimized. An interesting feature, and you'll see the structures of each of them, uh, the, the three of them, independent, no genetic relationship at all. So this is a recipe that nature developed independently uh, three times and in each case came up with a similar uh, construct. <clears throat> It's also a great area for um, fun, and uh, just uh, <clears throat> I'll point out a couple of features that, that probably I think uh, faculty are aware of. But uh, you know, in biochemistry, we, we don't teach a prokaryote biochemistry. We teach human bio, we teach NIH-oriented biochemistry, and um, <clears throat> there is just a tremendous amount of biology out there that's quite unusual looking or biochemistry that's quite unusual looking that we don't typically hear. And you know, it's a uh, it's um, pervasive, you know, there's a large population within ourselves. <clears throat> and uh, of course, this is the area of microbiology, only a very small percentage of known microbac or known bacteria, uh, prokarya or, or eubacteria, whatever can be um, cultured. So this is a, there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity. 
Okay, and in terms of the techno orientation, which again, I, we really aren't focused on in our group, we're really focused on the tinker toys of is this step or that step, and is it gonna be a methyl group or an ethyl group? But um, there's a couple of obviously attractive uh, features of simple feedstocks, cheap stuff, everything's made from uh, cheap materials, and uh, some of the uh, <clears throat> comments we've heard today in terms of the um, motivations for the, this uh, really impressive answer project that Mike has uh, organized. I'm gonna advertise just briefly, the, I'm gonna talk about each of the hydrogenases so that at least you know what's going on. We're very heavily involved with all three. This is the one I call the weirdo. This is the newest one. And I'm just gonna, just a few words about it. This is one that's involved in methanogenesis. <clears throat> that carbon will end up being methane. It came from CO2. And uh, this is the structure, or this is the group from the uh, Max Planck and Marburg, uh, <clears throat> at least the isolation work by Rolf Tower. <clears throat> new cofactor, pervasive in this area, new cofactors um, uh <clears throat> in this thing. Um, and this is the structure that was published in Science last year. It's been revised significantly in the past few months. <clears throat> this is the new structure. Uh, they missed an acyl ligand. They thought the carboxylate was free, but the acyl ligand is on the iron. <clears throat> so it's a facial system, and I, uh, I don't really have any hydrogenase-oriented work other than saying that uh, we now, we can never model the previous science report, but we can model this thing uh, very well. We've just been working on this since uh, February. And uh, again, this is, this is the, uh, the CO inhibited form of HMD. Of course, we know what's going on here is that somehow there's a hydrogen activation. One of these COs is gone. This is, we don't, the real enzyme, of course, isn't, it doesn't have three COs. It's only supported by two. And there's an H2 activation step. We don't know which site the H2 activation occurs on, at least I don't. And um, there's got to be a head, one of the characteristic features of all of these hydrogenases is that they are heterolytic. They, they split the H2 into protons and, and H minus. And the H minus almost always resides on the metal and the proton has to go someplace. And that's one of the, uh, car uh, the crucial features of figuring out this mechanistic puzzle is where does that proton go? And it's the showstopper unless you figure out where that proton goes because the rates just die if you don't have a place for the proton to go. And we don't know in this situation, conceivable that the acyl, quite basic, is the proton acceptor to give some sort of a carbenoid ligand. But you can see that already just using a very simple uh, construct, we can make um, uh, spectroscopically um, great matches. This is a cyanide inhibited thing. It, really very close to what the, uh, what nature, what Rolf Tower sees in Marburg. Okay, these are the stars <clears throat> of the hydrogenase business. This is the old one, hydrogenase 1.0, so to speak, and uh, this is the slightly newer one. Um, this is the structure that came out of the Gren Grenoble group, in a certain extent, uh, a very dominant uh, team on, in this whole area, Juan Fantasia Comps. <clears throat> so this is the structure that came out in the 1990s, isolated from desulfur vibrio, a species of desulfur vibrio. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think the feature to notice is H2 oxidation is faster than uh, proton reduction, or as they call it, the jargon is hydrogen evolution. Uh, the um, <clears throat> uh, uh, desulfuricans, desulfur vibrio, um, uh, this is a sulfate reducer, um, is uh, speeded up. And we're, I'm going to try to show you why we think nature's figured out how to work with hydride ligands and change them from here to here. And once again, a real baffling part that I don't have an answer for is H2 oxidation is tremendously uh, rapid in this case. <clears throat> um, this is the design, uh, <clears throat> the layout that is used in, um, in the hydrogenases. The NREL group has a uh, sort of an austere uh, <clears throat> version of this that's expressible, but uh, the um, 
from Chlamydomonas, uh, an algae, but the, uh, the typical hydrogenases are engineered in this three-channel motif, whereby <coughs> there's a proton shuttle um, sequence, uh, typically in a spartate-rich group. Um, there is this electron transfer chain that brings the electrons or holes in and out, and in this case, a cytochrome, cytochrome would dock there. And a disputed aspect is whether there's a hydrogen channel as well um, operating here, um, visualizable with uh, growing or soaking the crystals in xenon. Um, okay, and so I think the point here is that they're huge, uh, and uh, we're not going to try to make anything looking like this. The only part we're interested in, we're just trying to do cherry picking. We just want to go right after that and see if we can uh, replicate the uh, basic uh, synthetic chemistry or basic mechanistic chemistry looking at the active site. So here it is in uh, vibrant color. <coughs> um, I'm going to start talking about the iron, iron hydrogenase. It used to be called the iron-only hydrogenase until Tower messed things up and found this weirdo that's also got iron in it. So now we have to call this iron-iron hydrogenase. It's, a, it's a, um, <coughs> typically referred to as an H cluster. It's an interesting design. It's got a battery pack attached to it. It's a, 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 a catalyst design that we typically don't see in homogeneous catalysis, but would be an interesting one, and that is of having uh, uh, electron sync attached to the substrate binding module. Um, <clears throat> There's a, a dye iron thing, it looks like old fashioned metal carbonyl chemistry, which um, has been around for a long time. That's one of the reasons this uh, area really has attracted a lot of attention. It's not difficult to start on. <coughs> and um, it's got this one site here where substrate turnover almost certainly is localized. So <coughs> I think most of us, when we see a bimetallic catalyst, we think, oh, the two metals share the substrate. Not in this case. They share the electrons and they share the electrophilicity in some way, but the substrate's localized over on this so-called distal iron. Um, <coughs> here's the uh, uh, this chem draw for this thing. Yeah, a lot of strange things going on here. Cyanide, we don't know how it's biosynthesized here. It's not biosynthesized in the same way as the, the um, nickel iron one. We also don't know where the CO comes from. In the nickel iron one, the, all we know is the cyanide is made from a formamide, a dehydration of a formamide, the way organic chemists would do it, and we know that CO doesn't come from the same source. But um, a lot of bio, biosynthetic machinery that will be a second wave of biochemistry in this general area, and one of the really fertile themes that uh, is of great interest to us is how these things are made. Um, <clears throat> yeah, one of the interesting features about these hydrogenases is they are barely attached to the protein. This is, this is the one covalent attachment, this bridging cysteinyl group. So they're dangling there. They're, yeah, there are, um, and I'll show a picture later on, the cyanides are hydrogen bonded. The HMD, similarly, the HMD can be exchanged out by transthiolation and reconstituted. The nickel iron one is locked in a little bit more because the, uh, as we'll see a little bit later, there are four cysteines tied into the nickel. Here's the general um, idea that uh, guided our work <coughs> and um, a lot of question marks and there probably should be more question marks. We really don't know um, <coughs> where, um, <coughs> where things are in terms of uh, the hydride. Hydrides, of course, and one of the reasons that organometallic chemists are needed in the area is that hydrides can't be seen in the, uh, in the, in the uh, crystallography. So this is, there are two uh, main states. There's a reduced form, a diamagnetic, spin-paired reduced form, and there's an S equals one-half oxidized form of this enzyme. Yeah, separated by one electron, and we're doing two-electron chemistry. So you can appreciate that the iron four sulfur cluster is participating in this process. <clears throat> but in general, something like this is the way the catalysis transpires. A reduced metal is protonated, both get oxidized, at least in the way uh, an inorganic chemist would view things, <clears throat> and I'll show you later, these, the, the terminal hydride is somewhat hydritic, and this species then is reduced. <clears throat> this is our model for 
or one possibility for how it's reduced, we're not sure which, where the oxidation state lies here. We don't have the EPR on this system yet. <clears throat> and then this can go, undergo protonolysis <clears throat> with retention of the oxidation state. And similarly, the H2 oxidation goes in reverse. And this is uh, <clears throat> where Greg Kubis got his PhD. And so I always feel like I, I've given this a similar lecture a long time ago at, at Northwest. I always pay homage to Greg's uh, discovery of dihydrogen compounds. And that is a key, key step or key concept in all of its business. And that is that H2 is intrinsically non-redox active and non bronsted It's not a Bronsted acid. And the H2 coordination is the key that unlocks both of those reactivities. And that is once you bind it, quite acidic as a dihydrogen complex, and once you deprotonate it, you can oxidize a metal hydride that becomes redox active. In a sense, you confer redox activity onto the metal, onto the hydrogen, which didn't have it before. So enough of that. This is a discovery we made a number of years ago. <coughs> um, you can see the redox scheme is running reverse. We did it with a French group. Uh, but uh, <coughs> so this is reducing going to the left. And this was the discovery that these uh, iron compounds, and here we're using, I'll show a little bit of pictures in a more in a few, here's the propane dithylate. That's the linker group. I'm gonna deal with what that linker group is. This is a um, uh, iron complex that has ligands on it, typically, pho typically phosphines or cyanide, shouldn't be CO. <clears throat> and what you find is that they are catalytically active for making H2. It's not a great uh, 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 overpotential, but they are clearly catalytically active. There's a little bit of structure here, which I can explain uh, separately if you want to hear, but they're very efficient for making H2. And once we discovered this, people, uh, the coworkers in the field or colleagues in the field found that virtually all iron complexes under our good catalyst for making H2. So it's cheap stuff, it's not platinum, <clears throat> and uh, easy to make. A key mechanistic feature here is that the catalysis begins with protonation in order to make the metal reducible. A typical hydrogen uh, proton evolution catalyst would begin with reduction of the metal followed by protonation. So this one is a little bit different, and it's important because there are a number of people are in the field where they study L equals CO, the metal carbonyl. There you are forced, the metal is not very electron rich, you're forced to reduce and then protonate. <coughs> and nature almost certainly works in the other way. <coughs> and in our case, I'll show you in a minute, we work with um, uh, phosphines, not cyanides. This is, a, a, a again, a somewhat uh, detailed techie thing, but <coughs> Nature worked with cyanide. We call it nature's PME3, trimethylphosphine. <clears throat> it's a really great sigma donor. And um, for us, the great advance in the area of modeling hydrogenase was dumping cyanide and getting something in that wasn't, amp as we call it, ambidentate. Here's the typical kind of friskiness that it participates in. If you try to oxidize a metal cyanide, you, get Prussian, you start seeing the onset of Prussian blue-like chemistry. And, and uh, unacceptable for us. So we replace these donors with um, phosphines. And here's the basic uh, types of things. Again, for I have to give these talks to biochemists too, so I have to sort of explain a lot of uh, basic organic chemistry. We work with this propane dithylate as the linker. It's an interesting question about whether it is propane dithylate. <clears throat> we work with it both in the nickel iron and the iron iron hydrogenase, easy stuff. And you can say, well, maybe that's what's going on in nature, propane dithylate. Well, there's no example of propane dithylate in nature. All the, the cofactors, uh, all the cofactors, whatever the species is, would be unprecedented until this enzyme uh, is, well, they're all unprecedented. And we work with, again, we use, typically use ligands, phosph organophosphorus ligands. It looks totally strange. We resisted this for years, <clears throat> but everything works when we have phosphines on there and when we have cyanide on there nothing works. So it's a question of whether you want things to work or you want to be true to nature and get nothing to work. So we decided to get things to work. <coughs> yeah, here's the, uh, again, the uh, 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 structure um, picturing the hydrogen bonding network. And maybe this is the anchoring feature. Another, of course, interesting aspect here is to the extent to which these hydrogen bondings modulate redox potential, turn on or turn off based, or they strengthen or de-strengthen, 
so to speak, uh, as you change the redox poise of this uh, center here. So this is nature's design, and this is the type of thing uh, we typically study, sometimes with more phosphenes than here. And you can see, finally, I'm starting to say something about what we think is the cofactor, a really important feature. <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit about this hydride chemistry and um, tons of synthetic chemistry going into here. Here's how we can make a metal hydride, a di-iron hydride. This is an H-red model. It's a real big breakthrough for us. And when you make a species di-iron with a hydride with a strong acid, you can protonize this, make H2 coming out, and it's uh, straightforward redox chemistry. Things balance out quite well. And the point is that the terminal hydride is hydritic, and when you allow the species to sit, and it doesn't take very long, it isomerizes to what we call the mu hydride. The mu hydride are my graduate students mortal enemy. <clears throat> this is where these compounds all want to sit in this state. <clears throat> and we don't understand how nature precludes that. <clears throat> but um, this is the state, and this state uh, has no reactivity towards protons. All boron hydride chemists know bridging hydrides are somewhat protic, and terminal hydrides are Bronsted, I mean, are, are hydritic, and this confirms that. <clears throat> now there's a so this is an interesting advance in the sense that shows us this is it. This is the substrate bound in a biomimetic way on the darn model. It's very, very uh, sophisticated uh, advance for, uh, for this area. <clears throat> the problem is that we are installing the hydride using an unrealistic system. We bore a hydride, no bore hydride in nature. And then this group in Brest, France, in France came about <clears throat> and showed that when you look carefully at very low temperatures at the protonation of iron-1, iron-1 compounds, <clears throat> they give mu hydrides, but they go via pro terminal protonation. And this is a clue that indeed uh, nature could be pulling protons out, placing them on a single iron, and turning them over here. It's a really, really big advance. In the area of organometallic or metal, once there was a field called metal cluster chemistry, gone now. But uh, <clears throat> there, there is a huge amount of interest in protonation of metal metal bonds. And it's always been assumed that that is the kinetic site of protonation. And this work casts doubt on whether that, in fact, is the kinetic site of protonation. It may well be that the kinetic site in most of these systems is a <clears throat> metal, a single metal followed by isomerization, which is typically what's seen in uh, metal carbonyl cluster chemistry. Here's uh, some of our own work. <clears throat> we're, we're using this very rigid um, ligand, and you can see um, uh, terminal protonation. It happens at the non-basic site. Not the phosphine site, the other site. It's where it thermodynamically it would be if you looked at the choice. It wants to be, the hydride wants to be on with the, sigma, with the good pi acceptors, and then you see this isomerization, and we can um, one of the advantages of using phosphines, of course, is we really have tremendous detailed knowledge about um, where substrate is and um, <clears throat> what it's up to. So you can see, that, again, the terminal protonation. So this now allows us, with our models, to use protons, as the French group showed us, and then try to drive catalysis in a biomimetic manner. <clears throat> Now, of course, the question that came up from the French group was whether you needed to be unsymmetrical in order to get this terminal protonation. And here's a, a relatively crowded system that we've developed over the past couple of years <coughs> where um, here, again, it's a symmetrical, that is, there's two phosphines on each end, and once again, it's um, terminal. And this is actually somewhat robust. You have minutes at room temperature <coughs> to um, study this uh, species. So it's a big, uh, it's a... Uh, a significant advance in the area. This, the French work is all very low temperature stuff. It's significant, but uh, difficult to study. And now we can start looking at the ECAM of this thing. <clears throat> and um, uh, so this is the, here's the ECAM of what is, the, what is supposed to be terminal hydride. So we're looking at, we're reducing. There's the terminal hydride. 
Yeah, it's got some impurity. It's isomerized already in the CV cell, cyclovoltametry cell. It's isomerized a little bit to the bridging hydride, as you can see there. And when we let the system sit for a few minutes, yeah, you go to completely to the bridging hydride. The interesting point here is the clue or design clue about catalysis, and that is that the terminal hydride is easier to reduce, a couple hundred millivolts easier to reduce than the bridging hydride. So <clears throat> not only is it easier to get at that terminal site, it's easier to reduce it. So both of these speak to something related to overpotential <clears throat> in eventually um, evolved systems. Um, we can also do simple experiments where we can uh, look at the effect of acids on the, re the reversibility here and essentially uh, estimate a pKa here for this reduced hydride. And uh, you can see it's about two. This is the type of thing we do with protonation. We, can, we use a, a phosphorus based acids, non aqueous chemistry, of course, here. A, a characteristic of our work is all, all non-aqueous base thus far. So we can, uh, we're starting to be able to peel away at figuring out a lot of details here. <coughs> um, a big question for us is uh, the, and we, uh, we don't know the answer here, is the site of redox. This is an important feature. Um, metal hydrides are very rarely redox active. <clears throat> but it may well be that, um, that in a binuclear system, that rule is relaxed because you're not redoxing the, the metal that's holding the substrate, you're redoxing its neighbor, and in that way, subtly influencing the uh, inductive or in, sort of inducing greater hydri hydridicity uh, of or nucleophilicity of the hydrogen. We don't really um, <clears throat> know uh, what is going on. We don't know which site here. We just haven't done the uh, low temperature um, EPR studies quite yet. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> now I want to talk about the cofactor here. The, this is, here, so I've got this propane dithiolate. One of the problems is you, pr you can put a proton on. We use relatively strong acids. We have to use HBF4, <clears throat> something on, on that scale. So in a senior trial, quite negative PK, uh, very negative PKAs. And um, you can't deprotonate them. And they should be relatively easy to uh, deprotonate. And this is a real big surprise. And <clears throat> this is a problem that nature figured out how to solve. And once again, our, um, our friend's biophysics group in, uh, in, in France came up with a proposal for how this problem is solved, and that is this amine containing cofactor. All the crystallographers really know is that they have something carbon like, carbon like, carbon like in that strap. They couldn't tell the difference between nitrogen, oxygen, or whatever. And the um, Juan uh, Fantasia proposed that it's an amine. We made the cofactor <coughs> and showed that indeed it makes a difference. You can see uh, that Gary Brudwig's uh, colleague here would be very pleased to see that uh, Bob Cradtree chemistry. Essentially here, whereby you have this participation. This is the theory, right? This is 2001 from Juan Fantasia, a biophysicist coming up with this kind of idea, fairly sophisticated idea. And this is the cooperation. It's actually a little bit reminiscent of the calcium oxide, hydroxide, hanging over the other oxide too, this, this uh, pendant um, system here. But in any case, this is the idea that uh, Juan came up with, and here is how the, the chemistry plays out. So if we make the same hydride, these hydrides think they're the same molecule, that is whether it's got bis DPPV and PDT or ADT. It's the same hydride, all the spectroscopy is the same. The difference is when you've got an ADT, you can pull that proton off in a rocket really fast. So low temp, triphenylphosphate, and crappy base, it just has to be, of course, has to be above the pKa of the, of the amine. And you have to take my word for it, but this is a spectrum of starting point, and that's complete conversion. Here's the corresponding competitor cofactor, <coughs> at least the non-carbon one. Here's the oxide. And uh, the point here is nothing happens. And um, <coughs> we're adding triethylamine, a hammer base, you know, 18 pKa, really, really strong base, and it, it just can't come off. It can't figure out how to come off because it doesn't have that helper group of the amine. 
So um, this is a very good clue. If you want to do rapid acid-base chemistry, a critical component, you need to have an amine there. If you want to get an advantage on the potential, you want to have a terminal hydride. <clears throat> and here's some data we're just getting um, in the past few weeks. This is the corresponding uh, amine hydride. And here we're looking at uh, essentially numbers of equivalents of acid, and we're looking at current. Uh, normalized current here. And you can see that this, and my student assures me, it goes up forever. <clears throat> now, of course, I said, well, show me 50 units. But uh, in any case, all I've got is five, uh, whatever square root of, uh, the, well, the square of five is so 25 equivalents of acid here. But you can see that this thing is insatiable in terms of the proton supply. And when we work with the corresponding bridging hydride, which all our competitors study, I don't know why, but if you look at the corresponding bridging hydride, it just um, slows down. Because the problem there is this reorganization energy of protonating a metal-metal bond is really viscous, very slow. So <clears throat> it just, you, you just uh, level out on this thing, and um, it's not a very good catalyst, at least on, on this criterion. <clears throat> and once again, I think the really nifty part is how this hydride knows there's an amine up there and is um, <clears throat> uh, easily deprotonated. And this thing with the oxide, um, very slow to deprotonate, and with carbon, nothing. So nature came up with, it's also probably a little bit easier to imagine how you would biosynthesize this thing. These are C1 subunits. The general idea for those interested is radical sand chemistry. It looks a little bit like biotin biosynthesis, in fact. I want to talk just a few minutes about um, the oxidized form. This is a less solved problem. You would think that if we can reduce protons, we could also oxidize H2. And this has been, um, uh, there's a lot of asymmetry in our progress here. So <clears throat> this is the so-called H ox form, S equals 1 half. Um, we and uh, our Friends in uh, College Station both have been able to make very good models for this. <clears throat> this is our system, kind of juiced up iron, iron, iron one, iron one, a little bit bulked up as well. It's got these, this chelating phosphine. We're not working with a biologically relevant cofactor here. We're just trying to get a result and see if anything works. At least this stage, we work with this ethane dithylate oxidation. Beautiful. Crystal structures, the whole, everything works out fine. Um, and here is the mixed valent species. And it's a little bit strange and a, still a little bit controversial. At least on this side of the Atlantic, we think that the oxidation state assignments are like this. And on the other side of the Atlantic, I think they think they're reversed. But the idea is that you get oxidation, we get <coughs> um, oxidation with no rotation. So you oxidize this thing. The one that doesn't rotate stays octahedral. Well, it's D6 in a sense. And the one that does not get oxidized rotates. And you can see why one would be very interested in this uh, chemistry, because it exposes a vacant site um, here that is on the di supposedly on the distal iron. <clears throat> Some, uh, uh, you can inhibit this species. This is an interesting experiment, at least if we're interpreting the, the hyperfine values correctly. <clears throat> so here's, here's our friend. This is HOX. It's localized. We see this uh, triplet uh, coupling to the diphosphine. This is the paramagnetic site over here. It doesn't know about the phosphine over here. That's our interpretation. When you introduce CO, <clears throat> it becomes spin delocalized. And the interpretation that's significant for us is that when you, instead of binding CO, if you bind H2 here, that oxidizing power that was residing over here as ferrous then is shared onto the iron one site and now the iron one goes to iron 1.5 and is a little bit better able to polarize an H2 ligand that would be sitting over here. Nice reversible chemistry here. <clears throat> and uh, once again, and it, it, I wish it were a little bit more impressive uh, uh, data, because I said the H, uh, the <clears throat> iron iron hydrogenase is a great hydrogen activator. Um, but I guess the good news is that this is a dud. This, this is the one with the propane dithylate, nothing. We're really pushing on this thing. And only with the um, azodithylate, again, these are HOX form, forms, um, do they pick up H2 and make the hydride. Now, 
uh, a little bit complicated analysis because the under this is done in a bomb and it takes hours we only fish out the bridging hydride but we can do it with deuterium and we're quite sure of this so once again cofactor is involved and is a critical component not only of putting protons onto the metal but oxidizing h2 <coughs> overall scheme which i don't think i have enough time to talk about <coughs> okay um, here's the typical mu hydride, one of my, I mentioned before, one of my students' enemies, this is what you get, it's been known forever in organometallic chemistry, you protonate a metal oil bond, you put a proton there. <coughs> um, you could imagine, uh, I'm just going to go through sort of a uh, thinking experiment, just going to change that dithiolate, we're going to change the metal to nickel, take a ligand off to compensate for the electron count difference. And now, voila, you finally see that this thing that all of our friendly competitors are studying, which we think is not a model for iron-iron hydrogenase, probably is a model for nickel-iron hydrogenase because this is that, that's its format, is that it does, it's an old system, and it works with mu hydrides. And um, <clears throat> here, here's, a, again, another one of these beautiful pictures of uh, the active site, the Higuchi structure from Japan. <coughs> Weird SF4 shaped uh, uh, nickel here. <clears throat> Nobody understands why. Two bridging thiolates, and here's the iron. Sort of, you can think of this if you're an organic metallic chemist, sort of like a CP, two cyanides and a CO. And <coughs> just blocks this site. <clears throat> and here is a zillion different states that are known, but there's only real three business states that are involved with the, uh, <coughs> the nickel iron hydrogenase. And <coughs> it's relatively agreed that it has a mu hydride in its functional states. So that's why we call it the hydrogenase 1.0. It's the old format and nature, I don't know how long it took, figured out that if you want to do rapid hydrogen processing, put it on one metal. Don't share it between the two metals. <clears throat> but um, this is the one that, this is the structure that came out in 1995 from, again, the Grenoble group, and people have been trying like mad to model this thing. Here's a uh, sort of a collection for those that like molecules of um, various uh, beautiful uh, structures that have come out from everywhere um, across the world. <clears throat> and one of the problems with all of these uh, models is, and I, I never figured out this, is, is that nobody ever puts a substrate on there. And the substrate's quite straightforward. You gotta put H2 or hydride on there. And so you're, you're just not going to make much progress unless you install the substrate. Well, <clears throat> this thing is poised to do chemistry if we could protonate it. And indeed, it works fine. But otherwise, there's just been um, a lot of statuary made, but uh, no functionality at all. <clears throat> so here's the chemistry for those that like to look at uh, uh, chemical reactions. This is a Schroeder molecule, it's a terrible. Uh, tricky synthesis, but we finally figured out how to do it right. And indeed, protonates, first nickel iron hydride dithiolate. We just published this, uh, <coughs> this or is coming out soon. And we can indeed get into this entire manifold of nickel iron hydrogenases using a very modular approach. We have these little, mo these little molecules, we hook them together, a quite uh, sort of Lego-like way of making these making these things, and indeed, um, <clears throat> uh, we can make a variety of substituted derivatives. Again, <clears throat> for, I, I, sort of, I feel like I'm in a group of people that are really focused on, uh, on really advanced concepts. I want to show that you know, this is sort of the, the marine work, the grunt work that we do. This is you know, how people go fishing in our group. <clears throat> so this is a discovery this is for the graduate student. This is sort of the how stuff is done. You, we just mix a whole lot of things together in an NMR tube and just try to deconvolute these things and find clues and then figure out what might be in here. So you can see this is a kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> complicated mixture that we made in the process of discovering this family of again, the first functional models for the nickel iron hydrogenases. And you know, the graduate students were able to say, yeah, this is probably it. Um, write uh, uh, this thing, and they get two signals because of the, the fold orientation of the propane dithiolate. <clears throat> Ton of new hydrides being discovered in here, or could be discovered if we want to go after them. And yeah, here's, here's the uh, beast. Uh, uh, again, first nickel iron hydride, first uh, hydrogenase, uh, nickel iron hydrogenase model, a lot of work gone, gone into it before us, and um, it's a great catalyst. 
um, at least in a uh, the quick look over at uh, proton reduction, um, very slick. We're doing this with uh, trifluoroacetic acid, and um, seems to scale. We don't know we don't know the order of reaction yet. Very very interesting point um, here as well. And I'm going to um, <clears throat> wrap up. The, the main conclusion that we have is, uh, I, and I should say for the uh, students that don't know me, basically I'm trained as a platinum metal chemist. And so this has been a little bit of a strain for us moving to the first row. And the, there's sort of a conservation of pain here. You either work with platinum metals that are expensive or you work with complicated systems where the choreography of catalysis is really critical. And that's essentially what we're learning from this. That is that nature uses um, cheap reagents, but very expensive, and, and the timing uh, is a part we haven't quite deciphered, or so the choreography of the catalysis, the proton-electron relay sequence is really uh, <clears throat> something that's not quite figured out. But um, both oxidation states have been nailed for iron-iron. Now with nickel-iron, at least we see the so-called, uh, the reduced hydride state of the nickel-iron hydrogenase. Um, <clears throat> very, at least a very promising um, hyd hydrogen evolution. I think uh, Harry referred to the uh, cobalt DMG. We haven't tried to compare this, but I think that probably is uh, the, maybe one of the best in terms of overpotential, the Jonas Peters, uh, Nate Lewis system. <clears throat> um, but at least these things are biomimetic and um, <clears throat> are, have a lot of promise and a lot of tunability. And there's a lot of questions, of course, still ongoing. We, we think that uh, the um, uh, <clears throat> the um, mixed valence azadiethylates, we figured out how to work with these. We don't know how to solve the H2 activation. Uh, it's a real problem for us. And um, uh, the other types of hydrogenases look equally promising. Lots of people have worked on this project and I'm really, really grateful to um, them. And uh, three graduate students, um, <clears throat> Brian Barton, Matt Olson, and Aaron Royer just done a terrific job uh, uh, sorting this thing out and lots of collaborators uh, across uh, the world that have helped us figure out this um, progress. Thank you very much. So, uh, Tom, I, I see Eckerd's name up there. Have you, uh, I was going to ask if you've used Mossbauer at all to try and look at the charge distribution within these systems at the iron. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, a anything else? <laughs> um, yeah, we, we, don't have, uh, we don't have a lot to say about uh, what we're, we're getting. The, the problem is... Uh, um, that uh, <coughs> Eckert wants iron-57 enrichment. And iron-57 enrichment, iron carbonyl is a little bit tricky. And we've had to work all that out. And we're just, we've been playing with this thing for years. But we are just now have a ferrous chloride route. So we can take iron metal to ferrous chloride and build these things. And so we don't, we don't know. But it's obviously a critical step in all of this is the, is the most power, the iron most power. Um, so uh, you have to stay tuned. Eckert is, um, we've got the doers and we're waiting to uh, send them the samples. <clears throat> now, I had a question regarding the, the bridge amine that you use to take away the proton. It, 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 the mechanism looks very plausible until the point that you showed the triethylamine where I got a bit confused with the oxygen bridge. One amine gets the proton away, the other amine doesn't. So what is no, your... No, no, if you, if you have tri triethylamine, it's a very strong base. Yeah. And it will not deprotonate a hydride unless you have the amine cofactor. I should have... Mm -hmm. I was trying to be... Uh, trying to okay, but, but suppose you would have uh, two amines if you just have a... Uh, mm -hmm. is, is, that, is that in the deprotonation step two amines are necessary? So, uh, well, no, if, if you, you, you want to carry the... You know, if you want to take the proton away, you have to add some sort of external base. Otherwise, sure. the proton is going to sit there on the, on the, as a hydride. So you have to add an, an, an external amine to drive that equilibrium. 
And uh, as long as your basicity is above that of the amine cofactor, it's a very rapid reaction. We can't see it. We, we, it's instantaneous as far as we're concerned. If you don't have an amine cofactor, you, you simply can't deprotonate the hydride. It, you, can add, mm -hmm. you can add guanidine um, or very strong bases. That hydride cannot be deprotonated unless it looks up and sees an amine up there. If it looks up and sees an amine, it's ready to convey it so, out. So, it, so partly is then a, a steric hindrance or? No, or? no, no. I, well, that's a good question about when it looks up, wh so, yeah, why well, would it, it, it act differently when it looks up and sees an amine up there? Yeah. And somehow that hydride is polarized, or, but it doesn't seem to be, it's not exchangeable, it's mm -hmm. not hopping back and forth. Okay. But <clears throat> it's, a, it's a design feature that was cooked up, and I didn't bring it up on the nickel iron system, but the nickel iron system, which is a, doesn't have a fancy cofactor, it uses just, except for cyanide CO, it uses a terminal thiolate as the, uh, apparently, as the proton acceptor. Okay, thank you.